Well, good morning, Riverview Church. Hello out there. It's wonderful to see you on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at Riverview, and it's my real joy to add my welcome to the one Reese has already extended, particularly if you're joining with us for the first time or the first time in a long time. We're really glad you are here. We are Riverview Church. We're a community of people. We love Jesus, and we're following Him. And every Sunday, we gather like this to worship together and to be recalibrated around the Word of God. And so that's what we're going to do again this morning in the time that we have. But now over the last five or so weeks, we've been working our way through a sermon series that we titled Flourish. And together we've been exploring the 23rd Psalm and all that it has to say about rest and renewal and life with God. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to encourage you to get them out and turn to, you guessed it, Psalm 23. We're going to read together from verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, I wonder if you can remember all the way back to the year 2000. Anyone remember back to, it was 24 years ago. Can you believe that? Madness, right? Now, I remember specifically September 2000. I was about eight years old at the time, and we were on a family vacation in Coffs Harbour on the New South Wales coast. And I remember tuning in for the opening ceremony of the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Boy, oh boy, what a groundbreaking, spectacular display of music and dance and Nikki Webster's strawberry kisses, Ollie, Sid, Millie, the mascots of the games. It was a fun time. But I, I remember in particular, this is a really strange memory that, that I have, the the kind of commercials they would play, because this is prime time television, right? And, you know, of course you have, you know, the Vegemite commercials, Aeroplane Jelly, all the memorable tunes. But I remember it was during the opening ceremony of the 2000 Sydney Olympics that for the very first time I heard this song. Now, excuse the quality, this is 24 years old. So we'll play this song for you. Eventually. Here we go. I've been to cities that never closed down from New York to Rome and now, we can play that in the background just to keep the feels kind of going. Now this song I still call Australia Home. I'm sure you've heard this before. It was written uh, by the late Peter Allen and This song was written as an expression of his own personal experience. He moved to the US, achieved fame and fortune, but all the while longed for home. And you know, I think a good song captures an experience and it actually allows that experience then to be transferred to the people that are listening. Now, I don't think it was until I was living overseas in Canada, I was a long way from home until I really appreciated this song. I don't know how it happened, but YouTube or Spotify, some sort of algorithm sent me down a nostalgic rabbit hole and this song came on and I was a mess. I was crying. I was missing home. I don't even know what it was, right? I was sitting there in the cold Canadian winter thinking about eating watermelon after a long day on the slip and slide or playing cricket with my brothers. Now I'll cut this song, otherwise I'll start crying again. But you see, songwriting, right? Songwriting is this art that is about like empathetic, empathetic articulation. It's about taking an experience 
and articulating in, in a way that others might be able to join in with that experience, to identify with it. In fact, the best songwriters actually create language, create and provide language for future listeners to kind of pick up and actually use to articulate their own experience. And you know, Psalm 23 is a song of David. And King David writes for us a song that would capture his own experience of God. Now, Steve mentioned in week one of our series, the song that David writes for us is theological. So it is about God. It's about his nature and who he is. But it's also doxological. It's a song of worship. So it's not just facts about God, but it's actually David's experience of God, his personal experience of God. Now, David is like a brilliant songwriter because he articulates something for us of God that I think many of us in this room, if not all of us, have come to experience for ourselves. And so David actually gives us language to speak of our experience of God too. And you know, this is so much of what the biblical authors, by God's grace, provide for us as they build for us language and frameworks to actually speak of our own experiences of the living God. And so for David, he had experienced God as his shepherd, right? Verse 1, he tells us that. His good shepherd who provided for him and gave him places of rest, who brought him back and restored him. And David had come to know God as the one who leads him down these kind of well-worn paths of righteousness and the good shepherd. But there's also some experiences that David had, some things that he learned that I'm sure he would have rather not walk through. But it was only as he walked through the darkest valleys that he could testify to the fact that God was with him. And then we get to verse 5, which is our text for today. And David says this of the Lord, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I wish that said something else, right? Like you prepare a table before me once you've destroyed all my enemies. It's like a victory feast, right? There's popcorn on the table and you're kind of watching as God like annihilates all your enemies. But it doesn't say that. It also doesn't say you prepare a table of poisonous food for all of my enemies. Nor does it say you prepare a table for me exclusively for my friends and I. David's clearest articulation of who God is and what he does is that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a party or out for dinner and in walks that person. You know, you know that person that you've maybe got a little bit of beef with, things are awkward between you two. You're not on talking terms. Now, here's the thing about like a dinner party, right? It is very awkward when that happens because one way or another, you need to embrace one another. One way or another, you're going to have to interact. One way or another, you're going to have to make eye contact. Otherwise, it makes it so awkward for everyone else at the dinner party. But according to David, God is a little like uh, a strategically annoying host of the greatest banquet of all who chooses to invite even our enemies over for dinner. So he prepares a table for David, yes, but it's in the presence of his adversaries and rivals. Now, in the time of David, to prepare a table was, of course, a gesture of hospitality and kindness. It was a symbol of protection and provision and peace. Firstly, protection. You know, even in the Middle East today, when you are in someone's home and the table or the place of eating is normally at the center of the home, you are considered to be under their protection. In fact, in the not too recent past, you hear stories of US soldiers who get lost or stuck behind enemy lines and they find refuge in the homes of their enemies because protective hospitality is held in such high regard. So if you sit at the table with the Lord, you are safe with him. In his presence, you have his protection. Secondly, 
To prepare a table is about provision. Of course it is. It's to be tended and well fed. Now, earlier in Psalm 23, David uses a different metaphor, right? He, he talks of how the Lord is tending to us and providing for us as a shepherd does sheep. But this time, the kind of metaphor changes. This time, the Lord is not a shepherd. He is a host. He's the host of hosts. And He's providing for us as we sit at His table. Now, what's on the menu? I don't know. You choose KFC for me. I think it's in one of the later Psalms that talks about that. But the second part of of verse 5 tells us that David is anointed by the Lord with oil and his cup runs over. Now, these are, again, beautiful pictures of provision and hospitality. In the dry, barren lands of the Near East, as temperatures would soar and travelers would find themselves wandering on the road, the oil and the wine would be welcome essentials. The oil would become kind of ointment to soothe the skin. And of course, the wine or the filled cup would begin to clear a dry and parched throat. But this isn't just a little bit of wine or a little bit of oil. It's an abundance. And it's at the Lord's table that we have all that we need. Lastly, to prepare a table is about peace. It's at this table, the place I experience protection and provision, that I can sit in peace. I can rest at the Father's table knowing things are taken care of and I'm taken care of. I can experience peace with my surroundings and peace with God Himself. You see, the Lord's table is a place of reconciliation where I can sit with Him and commune with Him even in the presence of my enemies. Now, I want to invite you into a little bit of a thought experiment this morning. I want you to just paint a little kind of mental picture of verse 5 of Psalm 23. The Lord prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. What, what, what comes to mind? Imagine it. Perhaps it's a long table. I don't know. Maybe for you it's a round table. Let's just say on the table is whatever your favorite food is. So Steve, there's beans on toast ready and available. For my wife, there's quick curry in abundance. Now you're sitting there at the table because, you know, as Westerners, we kind of replace David with ourselves because we're kind of like the heroes, right? So we're there, we're sitting at the table. The Lord's there at the end of the table. Well, the question I wanna, want us to reflect on as we think about this is where is your enemy? In the scene that you're painting in your mind, I mean, the, the scriptures tell us that he's present to us. Now where? Perhaps for you, the enemy kind of stands in the corner of the room. He's bound up, watching you dine with the Lord, maybe a little hungry himself, but jealous of the food that the Lord is providing for you. Or does the enemy actually sit at the table too? Maybe a little bit further down your really long table, you know, like a throwing distance. But even your enemy is receiving Grace and mercy and provision too. Now, I find kind of mentally painting this picture fascinating because I sense there's a huge difference between the two postures, right? One, I sense in our natural response, I feel it feels a little bit like Jonah. The other, as I'm wrestling, I feel like feels a little bit like the posture of Jesus. Now, most scholars, when they kind of read this passage and they pick up David's context, they would assume that in this day and age, when an enemy was at dinner with a king, it was most likely like a victory lap, right? They were there bound up, kind of being mocked. It certainly wasn't to enjoy the food from the king's table. Yet, you know the problem with that, for us living like that on this side of the cross? Jesus. You see, Jesus reveals to us that yes, God delivers us from our enemies. He rescues us from our enemies. But what Jesus displays is God doesn't destroy our enemies. He invites them over for dinner. You see, Jesus reveals to us and demonstrates for us the heart of God in full. And while Jesus loved gathering people for dinner and not just the people who were like him, 
In fact, Jesus was constantly getting into trouble for the kind of people he invited over for dinner. In fact, this is one of the reasons he was crucified. Luke's gospel account tells us that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Amen. That's my Lord and Saviour. But the Pharisees, right, they were outraged by this. They called him a glutton and a drunkard because of the kind of people he was keeping company with him. And they were so incensed by who sat at the table with Jesus. See, according to the Pharisees, these were the kind of people who were the enemies of you know, God's good law, people like tax collectors and prostitutes and Samaritans, centurions and sinners. Yet all of them had a seat at the table with Jesus. All of them experienced his provision, his protection and peace. I don't know if you've ever... Uh, been to an allocated kind of seated wedding before, wedding reception before. And of course, the first thing you do when you kind of walk into the venue is you go and you try and have a look at, you know, the big map and it has all the seats and you kind of, is that just me, right? Like first thing you do is you go try and find your name because you need to prepare. Who am I going to be sitting with at this table? Do I know anyone? Uh, now, the last time we were at a allocated seated wedding, I did what I normally do, approach the floor plan, but I had a heart sink moment. Uh, I couldn't find our names on there. Like Renee and I weren't on there. And now I'm a, I'm a bit of a drama queen. So straight away I'm running through scenarios, right? Like what are, what are we going to do? Do we just go? We just leave? We leave now? No one will ever know. Uh, do we do we like cross someone else's name out and go replace our names to them? Oh, they must have forgotten about you. Sorry about that. Or do I send Renee over to have a word with the bride on her special day? I think you forgot about us. Instead, I, I sent my wife over just to have a second look and our names were there, thank goodness. Uh, of course, I had a bit of a husband look. But you know, in the kingdom of God, there is a seat with your name on it. But there is room for everyone. At the table of the Lord, there is an abundance of space. Even for the everyone or the someone <laughs> that you don't think should be invited. But every person is invited to come and dine with the Lord. No one excluded, no one disqualified. You know, I think this has kind of been God's heart all along, but it's a bitter pill for us to swallow. And there's books of the Bible that talk about this exact kind of truth, books like Jonah, that God prepares a table for us, but he doesn't just prepare it for us. And you know, well, I actually think David David did get this. King David got this. And we see glimpses of this in his life. Now, I think we all understand relationships are, are complicated, right? Like we live in a, a time of complex relationships, whether that's at work, home, family, friends. But if you think you have complex relationships, I think we can be honest enough to recognize that David knew a little bit about complex relationships. The youngest in a large family, as a military leader, as the king of a nation who usurped another king, as a man with children to multiple partners, David understood complex relationships. In fact, it would be safe to say in his time, David made a few enemies, whether it was the family of Uriah, the Philistines, the people on the other side of David's census. David probably had a few people who he might consider his adversaries, who he might feel a sense of tension with. Yet David was interested in pursuing God's heart. Yes, he was a wanderer, but in his life, we kind of see these little glimpses of the king who would come. And one of my favorite glimpses that we see in the life of David is the story of Mephibosheth. Turn to your neighbor and say, Mephibosheth. I mean, that is just a... Mephibosheth sells seashells by the seashore. It just rolls off the tongue, right? That's a good name for a child, isn't it? I'll chat with Renee when I get, get home. See, Mephibosheth was the, the son of Jonathan, the grandson of King Saul. Now, if you know the story of the Scriptures, you would know that the, the house of Saul eventually kind of becomes an enemy to the house of David. And of course, in this period of history and for many millennia, when a new regime came to town to reign, 
you don't want to be a part of the old regime, right? Because you're considered a threat. And so what would often happen is when a new, came, came, uh, a new king came into force, they would kind of hunt down any previous members of the old rule and have them silenced, so to speak. And 2 Samuel chapter 4 tells us that Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, about their death and, of course, their subsequent, the end of their reign as king. His nurse picked him up and fled. Now, this is, of course, a wise thing to do, do, knowing what happens at the change of power. But as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Mephibosheth. Now, this is like a tragic story a young boy who threw a fall through no fault of his own was forced to live an incredibly hard life. Yet through David, we see something of Christ, a little glimpse of the one who is to come. Second Samuel chapter nine, David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And so David finds this man named Ziba, one of the kind of previous servants of Saul's household, and finds out that there is still one family member alive. Now, I'm sure Ziba would have thought, you know, is this a trap, trying to have to figure that out? But eventually he tells King David about this son of Jonathan called Mephibosheth. Reading from verse five of 2 Samuel 9. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will... Always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? And so David reinstates property and resource to this young man and his staff. He provides protection and provision and he reestablishes peace. And verse 12 goes on to tell us that Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. I mean, this is a a beautiful story, a glimpse of what is to come. And this is one of those moments in in David's story that we're like, yeah, go David, good one. But here's the trouble. David is all too human. He's like you and I. And just as quickly as he moves towards the heart of God, he wanders away because on the very next page of the Bible, we read about how he sees a woman named Bathsheba on a rooftop and desires her for himself. And then the rest of that story, of course, is is a mess. But yet this story of Mephibosheth kind of gives us a glimpse of what is to come ultimately in Christ Jesus our Lord. But I love the story of Mephibosheth because in in some ways I, I sense that it's actually our story, right? It's all of our story that in one way or another we've, been bruised or broken, maybe through some of our own choices, maybe through no fault of our own. Yet all of us, through no credit of our own, have been invited to come and sit at the king's table, to commune with him as though sons and daughters. And this is the amazing grace of God that comes to us in our Lord Jesus. You see, it's at the Lord's table that enemies can become friends. It's as we gather around Jesus, focused and fixated on his grace and his way, that the things that have previously divided us and caused tensions between us can kind of fade away into the background. Now, let's just take a few moments to talk about enemies. This is a word that's thrown around a lot in the church, we love talking about enemies. So let's just talk about enemies. Because I know, you know, in the modern day, 
personally, I don't feel like I have that many enemies. Like most of us don't have nemesises, nemesi, however you say that. Like, you know, Superman has Lex Luthor, Spider-Man, he has, well, he has lots of enemies, right? The Green Goblin and you list them. But I feel like most of us don't have like a special note in our phone of our enemy. Well, maybe you do. I'll leave that to you. But what's really cool, in the Hebrew, the specific word that's used here by David for enemies, and there are a few different words that are used for enemies, but the specific one he uses here could similarly be translated as to cramp or to be tense. Now, of course, those words can be used literally in the Hebrew or or kind of figuratively. In other words, David is suggesting that God prepares a table before me in the presence of my tensions, my afflictions, the things that are causing me to cramp, causing me turmoil. And I love the kind of nuance that we find in that Hebrew word for a few reasons. Firstly, because I think we know as friends of Jesus, we know ultimately the enemy has been disarmed at the cross. We know that Jesus has set us free from slavery to sin. Yet, each and every one of us, this side of eternity, still experience the tensions and the cramps of being new creation people in an old creation world. In other words, the enemies of the soul, uh, soul kind of still exist. They just don't hold power over us. But they can still cause a whole lot of tension in our Lives. Secondly, I love the nuance in this word because I think it's generous enough for, yes, external enemies, the people out there that are out to, to get me, and internal enemies too. Because I think in, in our modern day and age, whilst we may have relationships that could do with some work, I think few of us would consider having specific enemies. But not only are those tensions external and relational, For a lot of us, the tensions that plague us are internal. Things like worry and anxiety, the need to be in control, jealousy, greed or pride. And I think every single one of us find ourselves in the presence of these kind of enemies. Even the Apostle Paul, right, he talks about this thorn in his side, which is giving him grief of which he asked the Lord to take away, but he didn't. And God's promise isn't the removal of these tensions, but it's that he prepares a table for us and blesses us and protects us and provides for us and gives us peace in the midst of these things. You see, it's the wisdom of God that I think teaches us to sit across from these enemies and actually embrace reality. To look at what is, to look at our fear, our anxiety, to acknowledge their presence and yet enjoy fellowship with God. Just the other day, um, we were getting a quote from an air conditioning guy for obvious reasons, right? Um, We need to install a new vent in one of the rooms of our house. Almost every room has a vent except one, so we need to get that installed. And so we had this guy come out, and he was going to give us a quote. And this guy had uh, a unique look, let's just say that. He was a very large man. He had a really large beard, rosy cheeks because of the heat. And he was climbing up and down into the roof. And so my two-year-old son, Joey, is sitting there. I'm having a you know, proper conversation about the cost of what this air conditioning could be. And Joey comes out from the living room and he goes, Dada, it's Santa. <laughs> now, fortunately, the aircon guy didn't hear that. Renee comes in and kind of grabs Joey and ushers him into the other room at the top of his lungs. It's Santa, it's Santa, it's Santa. That man looks like Santa. She's there trying to kind of hold his mouth and he's breaking out even more. Anyway, he eventually runs into the room because, you know, Santa's getting in and out of the roof and walks up to him and and Joey asks this air conditioning guy, hi, Santa, have you brought me a present? Um, To which we were just like, oh, oh. Now, I still haven't got the quote from him, so (laughs) we'll see. We'll see. But... To be fair, 
he looked like Santa. <laughs> like if we're gonna embrace reality, we just had an adult filter, <laughs> but we probably would have acknowledged that yes, this guy looks like Santa. I mean, he's climbing in and out of the roof. I mean, it's, it was too good. But you know, there's, there's something about acknowledging and embracing what is true and what's in front of you. There's something actually liberating when you kind of vocalize and speak up and front up to the tension that sits across from you. In his um, brilliant book, In the Shelter, Irish poet and theologian Padre Otwama repeats the uh, refrain, hello, again and again and again. And he explores the power of greeting, the many feelings and tensions that we experience, especially the ones that we don't want to greet. So hello to old wounds. Hello to my lack of capacity, my lack of control. Hello to the unexpected phone call. By saying hello to something, you're acknowledging that I'm present here, yes, but this is present here with me too. It's a radical act of naming the simple truth of the present moment. It's about acknowledging what is in the presence of the Lord Jesus. It's not about pretending. It's not about hiding or minimizing or pretending everything's okay, but it's about radical honesty. Learning to listen to what you're experiencing and, and greet it. Not to control it, but also not to let it control you. And I think it's because we sit at the Lord's table that we can boldly say hello to the tensions that sit across from us. In the presence of Jesus, those tensions become like a bee without a sting. They're still there, but they can cause us a whole lot of turmoil. Yet even in their presence, we can learn to fellowship with our Lord Jesus, to whom ultimately all things bow. And so often, you know, God does not destroy our enemies. Instead, he invites them over for dinner. And I wonder if this is all part of God's glorious grace. You know, that what is better than removing these things and destroying these things is actually using them for a tool in our formation into Christ-likeness. You know, in two weeks' time, uh, Steve, Reese, and myself are going to be hopping on a plane and, well, truth be told, like three or four planes, and we're going to be making our way to Tanzania, and we're going to be spending some time with one of our incredible partners, Water for Africa, and then on the back half of the trip, we're heading to the northeast of Tanzania, and we're going to be meeting up with a few others from our community and climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Now, I'm excited, but I'm also aware, realistically, a trip like this is going to be filled with tensions, um, of all sorts, right? Externally, in relationships, I mean, traveling with people, you know what that's like, right? It's a way to get to know each other. But please pray for me. I mean, I may have to share a tent with a guy who eats beans on toast for every meal. Good <laughs> Lord, have mercy. But you know, whilst I'm aware of the, the tensions that will be there externally, um, I'm also aware of the kind of internal tensions we're going to feel, both mentally but also physically. Now, I mentioned, uh, I think a month or so ago, that my chosen method of training has been running, and it's been great, but the, the trouble with running is, it's, as many of you would know, it's pretty difficult on your body, and you pick up soreness and, and injuries, and so I've never before have I seen a physio <laughs> as much as I have in the last few months. And so I've been seeing a physio, and just last Friday I was there because my right calf has been causing me a bit of grief and I was kind of a bit stressed out, a little bit worried and, I, you know, I want to climb the mountain injury free. Like I want to show up and be like, I'm ready to go. I've got no issues. And um, my physio when I was there speaking like a prophet of the Lord rebuked me and told me to stop being idealistic. And they said, whilst we can kind of help and treat and, you know, give you stretches and, and help improve a little bit you're never gonna climb up with a clean bill of health. If you are alive and you are active, you're gonna have soreness here or there. 
And what you need to do, she said, is learn to keep walking with it. You need to keep figuring out how you're going to make your way up the mountain whilst you carry it. And there's strategies and bits and pieces you can do to help you with that. But you need to acknowledge that you're going to carry your tensions up the mountain. And that shook me a little bit. But it made me realize that's sometimes what God does for us as we follow Jesus. For whatever reason, he doesn't always remove those tensions. And the Apostle Paul knew that all too well. He doesn't destroy all of our enemies. But it's actually in his generous and abundant grace that he teaches us to live well and fellowship with him even in their presence. So as disciples, we learn to follow Jesus thorns inside and all. There's no idealistic world where you, you, know, you, you follow Jesus and you don't have any tensions, you don't have any turmoil. It doesn't exist. But I think Jesus also in his great wisdom invites us to pay attention to those tensions, not to be unaware of the thorn that sits in our side. See, as we are honest with Jesus about these things, he goes to work, healing, restoring, repairing, And in his grace, we learn to live in fellowship well with him in the presence of these enemies. So friends, may fellowship with our Lord give us courage to look up and acknowledge the tensions that we experience every day. And may our lives and prayers be shaped by the character of Christ who does not remove all of these tensions, but rather invites them over for dinner. Let me close by reading from Psalm 23 one more time. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Can I invite you to stand with me? Before I take a moment just to pray for us and draw our time together to a close, I would love for us just to take a minute to pay attention to those tensions that exist for each and every one of us. And maybe that's the the small gift that I can give each of us this morning is just giving a moment to actually pay attention to the things that are in the room. I think so often in a busy world, we don't stop long enough to go, actually, I'm feeling worried about this thing or This thing is causing me grief. This morning, let's give time in the presence of the Holy Spirit with the Lord at the head of the table just to acknowledge the things that are in the room. So why don't you just close your eyes, bow your heads. If you feel comfortable, you can open up your hands before the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Move amongst us and minister to us. Lord, so grateful this morning of the invitation of fellowship at your table, that every single person here today has a seat with their name on it, that you invite us to live and sit under your protection and your provision and experiencing your great peace. And Lord, it astounds me as to the fact that that can all be done even in the presence of all these tensions. But Lord, you invite us by your spirit to pay attention to the things that are there. And so this morning, God, we just want to take a moment to pay attention to that. Lord, for the things that are causing us grief or turmoil, whether external and relational, whether internal, Lord, we place those things before you. You know that they're present. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people who learn to fellowship with you well, even in the presence of our enemies. Lord, help us to be the kind of people who learn to follow Jesus well, 
even in the presence of our enemies. Lord, help us to be the kind of people who love one another well, even in the presence of our enemies. And as is the promise of Psalm 23, Lord, we know that surely your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace will follow us all the days of our lives. So bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, hey, it's been a great joy gathering like this. As always, prayer is available down the front. Come and say hi, and if you need prayer, we'll be down here. Otherwise, if you come into the new to Riverview lunch, come back at 11. Otherwise, we'll see you.